Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. The strain and pain lies mainly in the brain. <laughs> Despite that fact, um, we have tended to do things to the brain rather than use the brain in treating pain. And that has not been without considerable cost. The opioid epidemic is a disaster right now. In 2017, 47,600 people died of opioid overdoses, most of them unintentional uh, because of the potency in respiratory suppression with these high potency opioids. We've lost 360,000 Americans since 1999 to opioid overdoses. The annual death rate, which is rising very rapidly, is higher than the losses from gun deaths. And by the way, two-thirds of gunshot wound deaths are suicides, not homicides, and higher than the deaths from automobile crashes. So it's a national disaster. And I have a modest proposal to do something about it. Um, hypnosis is a state of highly focused attention. How many of you have the experience of getting so caught up in a good movie that you kind of forget you're watching a movie and enter the imagined world? That's a naturally occurring hypnotic-like state that many of us, not all of us, but many of us go into. Hypnosis is, has three components. The first is absorption, getting so caught up in something, like skiing, for example. If you don't get really absorbed in how you're skiing, you wind up on your back with your skis somewhere else. That's what's enjoyable about skiing. It pulls you away. You dissociate things that ordinarily would preoccupy you most of the time. And we tend to suspend critical judgment in hypnosis. We tend to do things, to get into the experience rather than thinking about the experience. And that's a powerful setting for helping people to better manage their bodies for doing psychotherapy. And in fact, we have good evidence that hypnosis is a highly effective analgesic uh, uh, treatment. Um, this is a randomized trial that we published in The Lancet in 2000. 241 people getting arterial cutdowns for chemoembolization in the liver or visualizing artery stenosis. Takes about two to three hours. Can't use general anesthesia. And the line at the top are people who just had intravenous opioids. They'd push a button, they'd get opioids. The people in the other two conditions had access to that, but they also, in the, in the middle case, the, the uh, blue, had the, an enhanced uh, caring with a, with a friendly nurse who was helping them through it. And the orange on the bottom was training in self-hypnosis. And you can see uh, on the bottom line that by the end of two and a half hours, their average pain rating was one out of 10, and it was five out of 10 in the standard care group, despite the fact that they had twice the dose of opioids on board because they were pushing it more. Notice also that that line ends before the others do, the orange line on the bottom. Uh, it wasn't that they died. It was that the procedures were completed 17 minutes faster on average and there were fewer complications. So it actually saved $338 of procedure, even paying for the extra staff person in the room. So it is a highly effective analgesic treatment, even in the setting of also using some opioids. Does it work for chronic pain? This is a randomized trial we did for women with metastatic breast cancer, had weekly group psychotherapy to help them deal with the stress of cancer, reorder their priorities in life, build bonds of connection with other cancer patients, and we taught them to do self-hypnosis at the end of the groups. And what you see, the upper line, is the increase in pain over that year in the control group getting standard cancer care, and the blue line is the pain levels in those who were in the support groups. Half the pain on the same and very low amounts of medication. So it works for both acute and chronic pain. Um, my daughter was interested in the work I was doing at the time, and this was her depiction of it. My dad hypnotizes people and makes them want to live longer. And you see a particularly successful clinical example of them <laughs> down there. And I, I, need, I need to tell you that Julia had her, her son um, uh, yesterday in Stanford Hospital, seven pounds, six ounces. Um, and uh, Axel is his name. Um, and um, she did one other thing. She said, I gave birth to two things. She also, yesterday, there was a ruling in federal district court that uh, immigrants who are receiving benefits from counties may not have difficulties with their green cards. So she's helped to block the Trump administration uh, from penalizing immigrants. So I have what my grandmother called pardonable pride. You know, that's what. Um, she also was right. It turns out that 
helping people with breast cancer live better help them live longer. We found at the end of that original study, of which I re reported to you, that um, the women randomized to this kind of supportive psychotherapy with metastatic breast cancer lived on average 18 months longer than control patients. And there are now 12 randomized trials that show a significant survival advantage helping people cope better. And fixing circadian rhythm disruption is one of the things that actually helps based on the previous talk. Well, what happens when hypnosis? Um, we've been able to show that there are specific brain regions that are affected by, the, by entry into the hypnotic state. And one of them is, you can see on the left, top left, down to the lower left, a reduction in activity in the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. The anterior cingulate is part of the salience network. It's a conflict detector. It tells us what to worry about, pay attention to, and what not to. And if you can turn down activity in that region in this controlled manner, you can get absorbed in what you're doing because you're not worried about what else you might be doing. Um, we found, in fact, a mechanism for that, that more highly hypnotizable people have higher levels of GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. It's a, 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 a neurotransmitter that is triggered by the benzodiazepines and we use to calm anxiety um, and inhibit uh, anxious activity. And so it is clearly related to the use of hypnosis. We also find that people, when they're hypnotized, have functional connectivity that is higher between, on the left, upper left, dorsal anterior, the, the um, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the insula. The insula is part of the pain network in the brain and the insula is also a mind-body conduit. So when the brain controls the body, increasing heart rate and blood pressure or decreasing it, it does so through the insula. And hypnosis disconnects the posterior cingulate cortex, which is involved in self-reflection, from activity in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So you do things, you don't worry about what you're doing, and that can help people reduce pain catastrophizing as well. So there are multiple circuits in the brain, turning down the brain pain network and disconnecting it from rumination that are plausible methods by which hypnosis exerts its effect on pain. You don't just um, ignore pain, you, you feel less pain. Um, uh, Ariel Poehler, who was supposed to be here today, I met him at the 2016 Brain Mind Summit, has worked with us um, in helping to solve the problem. So we know this is an effective use of the brain to control pain. How can we disseminate it? I figure in my career I've probably used hypnosis with 7,000 patients and research subjects. That's a lot. But I would like to help use what we've learned to help a lot more people than that. And he helped us design uh, a, an Alexa app that is interactive, so you're not just listening to a recording. The system processes your response to questions about how you're reacting and gives you a different hypnotic instruction after that. So it's a branch chain interactive form of hypnosis with Alexa. And for pain, you can hear it now and we have a demonstration outside, um, say Alexa hypnosis pain relief, and you'll get a choice of one of four possible hypnotic images. You're taught how to go into hypnosis and then tingling transformation. Imagine doing what you actually do to relieve the pain, warmth or coolness, and develop a sense of cool or warm tingling numbness. Um, go to a pleasant place, leave your body here and go somewhere else. We use this with children a lot. Just go play with your friends. We'll take care of what we're doing with your body here. Um, being kind to your body. A lot of chronic pain has to do with frustration at the body for making you so uncomfortable, and all that does is get you paying more attention. It amplifies the pain. And finally, pain is a slow liquid. You can move it to some other part of your body, and people feel that just having the ability to manage the pain in some way helps make it less difficult and painful for them. Um, here are some of the comments we've gotten from people who have used the Alexa app. I just want to stay here. I feel so relaxed. It guides you through a relaxed state that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do yourself. I feel like the fact that it's taking some input from me and giving me choice as opposed to, say, Calm or the other app, Headspace, um, gives them a sense of control. One of the great myths about hypnosis is that it takes away control from people. I've been trying to take away control from people for decades. It doesn't work. Instead, what I'm doing is teaching them how to enhance their ability to control their bodies. And I had a patient the other day who called me and said, you know what, doing my self-hypnosis the way you taught me is like taking a pain pill. So I'm taking less pain pills. I'm just doing the self-hypnosis. 
And in fact, our early results indicate that the people who are using the Alexa app start with an average pain rating of six out of 10. By one month, it's down to four out of 10, and it stays stable um, up out to three months. As proof of concept, we also wanted to see if we could help people with nicotine addiction. And so we taught people to uh, use self-hypnosis to stop smoking. When I see them face to face, half the people I see for one session will stop smoking and half of them will not touch a cigarette in two years. So we get one out of four long-term abstinence, which is better than you get with buspirone, uh, with Shantix, with the drugs, with cognitive behavioral therapy as well. And it's fast and it does not have side effects. We teach people for my body, smoking is a poison. I need my body to live. I owe my body respect and protection. You focus on what you're for. People who use hypnosis often use the phrase, if you want to get someone to do something, tell them not to do it. Don't think about purple elephants. That's what you think about. We don't tell people not to smoke. We tell them, think about treating your body the way you would treat a child or a pet. We would never do to our children or our pets what we do to our own bodies. So focus on what you're for, not what you're against. And people commented, a type of positive reinforcement. Um, I love the one on the right. This is my favorite response. Some <laughs> crazy ass voodoo shit. I mean this in a good way. My expectations were extremely low. I'd never even attempted to quit before. I did the app at home when I was by myself and I was actually able to relax and focus. It flipped a switch. I haven't even craved a smoke. And another one said, I cannot even believe I quit smoking after 30 years of smoking one pack a day. That sense of flipping a switch, seeing something change in their brain is what we can see with some people who use hypnosis. We found in, in our follow-up studies so far using this Alexa app, 15% quit at one month, 28% three months, and we have at six months a smaller number of people because we're still waiting for the follow-up time but we have two-thirds having quit and staying off smoking uh, at six and 12 months. Um, so we're starting now a company, Reverie Health, uh, to try and help people use their minds uh, rather than do things to their minds to help deal with problems like pain and smoking. Uh, I also met at, at the last Brain Mind Summit Wolfgang Daum, who's given us some very helpful business advice on how to market. Uh, and um, here is our team. You, you can meet them outside if you like uh, at our display. Uh, John Medina, a postdoc, Emma Zell, Stanford medical student, and Danny Kwan, our research ad administrator. Um, what we hope to do is develop more dissemination strategies to get this used, uh, develop other platforms like Google Health as well as Amazon Alexa, um, add other interactive apps for things like stress management, better decision making, insomnia, weight control, and other health related mind body skills. We know that hypnosis works for all of these and progress from a skill based, based subscription app to uh, getting FDA approval and using it as a treatment. Um, I want to especially thank the Amanda Manami and David Chow Fund. I think they are both here. Are you here, Amanda and David? Thank you, they have provided the support that made this development and research possible and we're deeply grateful for that. And my final hypnotic suggestions are, we have a discussion table at 1245 or whenever this session ends. And if you'd like to try it for yourself, uh, we have a display out there and our team can, will be glad to show it to you. The mind-body relationship is nothing to fool around with. He's saying what happened here, Sergeant, and the ambulance driver is saying it's a placebo overdose. We're pretty sure he only thinks he's dead. Thank you for your attention.